Something's all right until I take the quiz, and then when I take the quiz, I want to cry. And when I come to class, I want to cry more. <laughs> so we will see. Okay, how can I help you? Not to go. Pray. 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 Yes, that everybody would agree to that. Amen. That the material in that course is difficult. It's very mathematical, it's very rigorous, it gives you all the fundamental stuff, taking something from circuits, from physics, from maths, from different disciplines that you partially learned before. And now I'm blending everything together. I just trying to blend everything together. So obviously it's difficult to integrate everything together. It's not easy course. And as far as I know, this course is difficult in any other university. It's not like we are special here. <laughs> so special. I'm trying to do it as easy as possible, but I cannot use it easier, otherwise you will not benefit from that course. Because all the benefit from that course coming from understanding of all that mess behind. If you don't get that mess behind, you're not benefiting too much, so you will not be able to go to disciplines like machine learning, which is very hot right now, and uh, more and more people are needed. In those areas, things like signal processing or signal analysis of any kind, or biomedical imaging, or many other communication fields, uh, and even development of new circuits, you need some of that material at least. Not maybe all of material, but at least all the plus transforms and circuits parts of that course. So, like, yeah, it's difficult, but you have to get through it somehow, and you will all basically pass through that course, it's not a big deal. So it's not about grades, it's not about uh, how great are your grades or how bad your grades are. It's all about what knowledge you can gather from that course. This is all important. Everything else, well, we will handle it somehow. Everybody will pass it. So... You said everybody will pass what? The course. Yes. <laughs> Does it mean stop? <laughs> I mean, Does it mean quit? if you will quit right now and you will not come to the test, probably I will not be able to do much. Oh, no, no, I'm going to do the test. I, mean, I will be here for that. I, I looked at the grades yeah, recently. Really quick. Like, all the grades look like passing grades. At least. Oh, okay. So, uh, it's definitely from what I see on campus. And I understand that you worked a lot for the course, probably much more than for many other courses, or maybe for all the other courses, yeah. uh, hard to say, but look, this course is really fundamental for many other disciplines, so this is really where you need to invest your effort. Because if you are not getting that course, all the other courses which will come later will be too difficult for you, so it will be above your head. When you will start learning control systems, DSP, communications, and all the future courses that you are obviously taking after that course. So. I think that it's better to work now and then to have easy life later. Yeah, good luck, guys. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, I want to start. The, do you have any questions on the lectures or anything? Okay, so I would like to start that lecture from something which is very popular in control systems, which is block diagram manipulations uh, that they are doing all the time, manipulating different blocks, dividing systems into multiple blocks, combining those blocks together, any of those blocks will have some transfer function. This transfer function will be some function of Laplace domain, like G of S or H of S or any other letter of S. Okay? Now we will want to combine them in specific configurations. One configuration is serial configuration, like one goes after the other, like input of the second system is basically output of the first one. And this is how you build basically big systems. You connect them together through some sort of wiring of that kind. So you have subsystems for which you can define some transfer functions, but bigger system is too difficult to define transfer function immediately. 
right? So you basically divide the system into blocks, sub-blocks. For each one, you can find transfer function. And then you connect them based on the actual connection inside of the system. So if this is the type of the connections that you need, you'll find in that block diagram, then that block diagram, and then you want to find transfer function of the entire thing, which means y of s divided by x of s, because this is how overall transfer function is defined for the entire system, right? Built from two subsystems. And you can definitely connect more of those in series. You have parallel connection, which is basically you're taking single input and inputting the same input to two or more systems. Okay, so you have multiple systems or subsystems. You're giving all those systems the same input and adding all of their outputs. So they are connected in parallel, essentially. So the output are connected with plus, which is this is sigma, adding signals, and this is your y. So what is y s divided by x of s, which is the entire system? if you have those two blocks or more of those. And the most popular one is this one. This is feedback configuration. Now, this is the system that you will have, you will be dealing with that system all the time in control systems. This is the type of the system that you're controlling. So this will be some sort of plant that you want to control. You want this output to be something specific that you prescribe, and what you prescribe will be here. Okay, so you will give some reference input, like what you want the output to look like, and you will try to design the transfer function in such a way that the system will produce that kind of output. Sometimes this block also sits here, so sometimes it looks also like that. So you have controller, then you have the plant, and then it looks like that. So this is also feedback configuration, which means that you're taking output, you're returning that output through the controller, or some functions that you design, and then you subtract that from input. If you expect your output to be equal to your input, ideally, you cannot get it in most cases, but if you want that, obviously you want that signal to be zero. So this one minus this one, ideally should be zero all the time, for all times. Now. If you can design such G of S that will minimize that signal, you design control system which is following that signal, some sort of tracking of the signal. This is overall idea of all control systems in general. This is classical control. You'll have that in 426 course, which is control systems course. Okay? This is overall idea. You want that signal, which is produced by that motor or by that whatever system you have, Okay, you, you want to make the system to produce signal you want, and you show the signal here. So if the error here will be zero, or you approach zero after some time, after some transients, then your system producing exactly what you want, right? So the goal of control system is basically to design that thing, or to design that thing, which is called controller. Any questions so far? Okay, so now let's see how we basically compute those transfer functions, overall transfer functions, for those block diagrams. So first one is very easy, because look, what is that signal here in Laplace domain? So what do we get here? It's the output of that part. X of times H. Exactly. So we have X times H here. So what do you have here? So what is Y? X times H times G. Right? So you're just multiplying them. Because you're taking that one and multiplying by that one. And this is your all. So your overall transfer function is that one. You're just multiplying this one by this one. This is your overall transfer function. So you can write now those two together as a single block, single square with H times G in the plus domain. Now, Multiplication of two rational functions, because this is what you have as transfer functions in Laplace, right? Just like polynomial divided by polynomial, multiplied by another one of the same kind. It still will be polynomial divided by polynomial, right? So it still will, it will be a rational function of some kind. Just probably more complicated with more poles or more zeros, right? But this will be overall transfer function. So how about here? Here you have 
x and h times x, g times x, when we add them together, we get h plus g times x. So this is your overall transfer function. Again, if you have more blocks of the same kind, obviously you get more of those. Okay, if you have more in parallel. The same thing here, if you have more of those blocks, you just multiply more. But this is the overall idea of configurations. Now, this one is more tricky. This one is more tricky. Now, how can you compute here? What is the output as a function of input? Now, for simplicity, let's define a new variable. Let's call it E of S. This is L. <coughs> e from L. Because this is error signal between what you want and what you really have. This is overall idea. Now, let's write the equations that we have here. So, E equals to what? Uh, let's start with this one. So, what do we have here at that point? G. It's G times Y. So, it's coming from here. Yeah. So, it's G times Y. So, X of S minus G times Y equals to E. Right, so this is from the header. So E equals X minus GY. Now, given E of S here, what is Y? So Y equals E times H. So we have basically a system of two equations. What do you want to find from here? From here, we want to find what is y over x, which is our mm -hmm. transfer function. Right, this is what we want to find. So, we want to live in that system of equations. We want to leave y, because it will be here. We want to leave x, y, h is given, and g is given. So we want to get rid of E, basically, which is not given, because I defined it. Now, so let's put that E here. So it will be X minus G Y times H, right? I'm just replacing that E with that expression. Now let's simplify this algebra now. So it's x h minus g h y. So from here we have y equals x h minus g h y. Now you want y over x, which means that you need to put that y here, and then you'll have moving to that side. So y. 1 plus gh equals xh. And now I'm dividing both side, sides by x. So here dividing by x and here dividing by x. So we get y over x times 1 plus gh equals h. Now I need to divide by z thing to isolate z thing, which is just a function. It's just simple algebra. So y over x, which is just a function t, equals h divided by 1 plus gh. This is the formula that you will learn by heart soon. In the next course. <coughs> okay. Okay. This is how you get the So this is feedback configuration. The goal of control system is basically to design such a G that this transfer function will be as close as possible to one somehow. Okay, this is the overall idea of control systems. How you design that G. Any questions? Okay, let's take some simple example. Let's say you have simple configuration like that. You have constant gain and feedback loop. 
<coughs> now, you want to put here step function and see what happens to that one when y goes t goes to infinity. Like what is a steady state? It's called in control system steady state of the system. What will happen after a long enough time? It will obviously converge to some value. What will be that value? If you put in some step function, you have obviously from zero to one at zero time, what will happen to the output of that system? Okay, so let's see. So transfer function from input to output is k, one plus k. Because in that case, basically h is k, right, and g is one. Transfer function one. You don't have any feedback transfer function. Is it clear from the formula? So g is one, h is k. So it's k over one plus k. Okay, and this is y of s divided by x of s. So, y of s will be basically constant k, which is k divided by 1 plus k times x of s. So if you're doing the inverse of last transform on both sides, you get basically y of t equals 1 plus k x of t. So when t goes to infinity, and this is step function, in that case, x of t is u of t. So this is what they want to see. You will have also step response. What will be the amplitude of that step response? k over 1 plus k. Is the value bigger than 1, smaller than 1, equal to 1 for specific case? Smaller. It's always smaller than 1. So you never can get with that feedback loop to the value of one, which you generally want in control systems. You want the same value at the end. So you will always have steady state error. This is what it's called. Steady state error of the system will be always produced by set ratio. Okay? When that steady state error will be small, for which case? Very, very large case. For very large case, you have very small error. For small k, you will have big error. Okay? okay? Which means that in control systems of that kind, you will want the gain to be very high. Do you know what kind of, I mean, I don't know if you learned about those circuits yet, but are you familiar with any feedback circuit where the gain is very high and basically because of that, and you want to control that system with feedback alone? Okay. Hmm? Okay. Yes, operational amplifiers. So operational amplifiers, in electronics, they have almost infinite gain, like 200,000 or something of that kind. And then basically feedback controls the loop. Right? The gain should be huge to make steady state error small. In opens, this is exactly what you get. You just ignore the input current because of that. And you have virtual ground and other stuff. And again, maybe you will learn that later in electronic courses. Not everybody took those courses, but this is how it works. But you can get it perfect. Now, still you want to get it exactly one. Still you want error, which will go to one at least after some infinite time. This is the entire reason to have control systems, to control them despite their interest. We want to control them. Now, the idea, or you can call it a trick of some kind, is to include integrator in the loop. If integrator included in the loop, then like part of your design to include additional integrator. And just to remind you that integrator is 1 over s, it's like step transpose, uh, transform of all plus. So 1 over s is basically integration. If you will include here 1 over s in addition to that block in series, then this error will go to 0. Let's see why. So let's say you have system which is k over s. You can separate them into two separate blocks, but we see that if you setting them apart, you can multiply them always in series. Okay? And then you have minus here, plus coming from here, that kind of thing. So you include integrator as well. <coughs> Let's see what will be the overall thing. So y of s divided by x of s 
instead of k, we will have k over s divided by 1 plus k over s. So you can multiply both numerator to numerator by s. You will get k divided by s plus k. Right? Right. Now, what is a y of t goes to infinity? Do we need really to compute inverse transform? You can. You can use table to get the exponential, which is get into value. Now, do we need it really? Because you have the theorem. Which is final value theorem. Plus. Now, what those things are? The first one is basically transform of U of T, which is input. Because it's kind of input times transfer function, right? So it's like x times z. From here, you can write one more step. So y of s equals 1 over s times k divided by s plus k. Right? Any questions on that? So Laplace transform of step functions 1 over s times transfer function. This will be y of s. So y of t at t goes to infinity will be limit of s goes to 0 of s times z c. Right? S times the function. Now, the function is basically this one times this one, and this is times s. I probably should write that from the other side. Make it more standard. So it will be basically s times 1 over s together with the same which is on here. Now, s and s will obviously cancel. So, what does that thing will be for any k? k over k, which is 1. It will be always 1, no matter what gain is. For any gain, it will be always 1, which means 0 error. Isn't that nice? So where did the x go? S. I multiplied by x here. This is x. Yes. That's x of x. Yes. Because x of t is step function. And the last form of step function is 1 over s. Check the paper. <laughs> okay. I got it. I guess it's Laplace transform multi. And also integration in that case, but it doesn't matter in that case. So that way we're getting always zero error when t goes to infinity. So you have some still transient response, you have some differences when it just starts in time, but after a while it will converge to zero error. So you'll have exactly output one continuing. Any questions? Okay, let's try something else. Closer to circuits now. <laughs> some weird reason I picked some difficult circuit now. Conductor, capacitor, transistor. I don't want a MOSFET circuit then. <laughs> okay. This is the input. This is the output. Transfer function is the out divided by the in. That's how it's defined. So number one, find transfer function. Let's start with this one first. To find transfer function, we're using standard tools. This is two lectures ago, I guess. We're converting every L into S times L, every C into 1 over SC and R, leaving it as is. So this will be 1 over SC, this will be SL, and then we thinking about it as resistors, all of them, which will be impedance of each one of those elements. Now, Let's define something new. 
we will call that entire thing impedance C, which is basically capacitor in parallel to resistor. So C will be 1 over SC in parallel to R, which is R over SC divided by the sum. Okay, this is how you find two resistors in parallel. You multiply those resistances dividing by some of those resistances. Remember that thing? Yeah. yeah. Absolute. Okay, so now we need to simplify it. How we simplify it, we just multiply numerator and denominator by SC to get rid of the fraction. So we'll have 1 plus SCR and R on the top. Yeah, looks correct. Okay, now we have voltage divider between SL and Z. Right, because if you think about that entire thing, a single impedance and this is another impedance, you have divider between this one and this one. Yeah. Right. So basically, V out in S domain will be V in in S domain times Z divided by Z plus SA, which is voltage divider. Right. Now we put the Z here and there, and we get V in times R1 plus SCR, many more computations. Now we want to get rid of course of that fraction and of that fraction. Multiply. So we'll multiply by that thing, so you'll have V in times R. And here you'll have R plus S L plus S square C L R. Something of that kind. So this system obviously will have how many zeros? Uh, four twos. So the transfer function is seven. Oh, wait, right. here. So this is my transfer function. This is basically the solution to part A. But if I want to know how many zeros I think that system has, S's. Uh, so we need to. Well, no, that's no. zeros. Zeros are the past. Zeros are so, so the past. Zeros are poles. So we take poles with zero. You will have two poles and no zeros. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. So question number two will be draw poles zeros map. Oh. This is kind of I'm going over standard questions in the domain. So, first of all, we need to draw the axis. This will be imaginary. This will be real. And if you need to draw something, don't forget to write those down. Otherwise, it's not clear what kind of system of coordinates you are using in the channel. Now, where is that location? Sometimes I can give you maybe some numbers that you'll be able to compute actual location of those poles, but sometimes you cannot get it and need to do it in general form. But let's pick some numbers. For C equals 10 millifarad, L equals 1 candy, and R equals 5 ohm. So what do we need to do? Substitute. We need to substitute and define basic the roots of the polynomial, which is quadratic polynomial. Define roots of quadratic polynomial. So this is what you will get. Let's use the part of the board. Okay, 
right? So our transfer function is the name for it. Now, so the transfer function h of s will be and b s squared plus one over fifty b s plus one over ten b. Now pay attention is that I divided the entire thing by the coefficient of s squared. That all thing will have like s squared times one. It's much easier to compute than roots in that way. So compared to this one, I just divided everything by C A R, numerator and denominator. Okay, let's see what happens here. So after some basic algebra, we get 100 divided by s squared plus 20s plus 100. Can you identify what that thing is? What are the roots? Just by looking at it. 10 and 10. Repeat. It's actually minus 10. Next step. You cannot what? have like plus 10 here because it will be positive, positive, and positive. You cannot have zero, so it should be negative something. Yeah. Right? So it's just. Yeah. This is what it is. It's like s squared plus twice s times 10 plus 10 squared, which is exactly what that thing means. But you can use formula if you want. You won't have to guess it. So, from here, S1 and 2 equals negative 10. And then if you want to draw it, you just go here and say, let's say, minus 10 is here. And then you draw in here double X, not single X. Okay, this is very important that you will write, or double X, or you will say multiplicity, Two, that I will know if I'm asking that kind of question on the test, that I will know that you know that you have two of those there and not single one, not single x. Single x is incorrect. You have two of those. Okay, so pay attention that you need to draw the number of poles by just doing double x so that will be visible, or you're just writing how many x's you have there. Otherwise, it's not clear. Any questions so far? Okay, next one is asking to find impulse response. How can I find impulse response of the function? So we are looking for inverse of last transform of that function. So you can take obviously 100 out, and you have in the tables 1 over s plus a squared, something of that kind. So it's 100 times whatever you have in the table. T S N minus M T step of T. This is equal to response of the system. And the last one, which is the most important part of that topic that you have today. What kind of filter is that? No. <laughs> Do you think so? Because twenty five percent chance. It's because yeah. it's a you have many different kinds of filters. You have low pass, high pass, bend pass, bend stop, notch, bend pass, notch, bend stop. You have look what you've done. Look what you've done. Like multi band, 
we, we just blend all of them together. So how do you know what kind of people is that? So as, as it gets bigger, then the denominator will get bigger, so it'll go towards zero, it'll right? tend towards zero. So it's BA. So essentially, uh, you have two ways to think about that in circuits. One way is just drawing border diagram, or it's an approximation of border diagram. So you know that each pole will add you minus 20 dB to dK, and both are at minus 10. So you're going like nothing flat until you go to 10, okay, and then you have minus 40 dB to dK. So this is magnitude pole. So taking the H and dB, so it will be something starting from somewhere, doesn't matter, and then it goes minus 40 dB per dK. And then um, 10. Right, this is how polar diagram will look like. So it's obviously low pass filter, which means it's spacing low frequencies and blocking all the high frequencies. Right? And blocking more when you go further in frequency. Mm -hmm. But how can you think about that based on the circuit itself without doing anything else? Have you learned that in circuit courses? How do you know what kind of frequencies are passing? Or what kind of phasers will be Look in that system. So, and no, not at all. Capacitors has nothing to do with. You, you can have high pass filter with capacitor or low pass filter with capacitor, band pass filter with capacitor. All of them will have capacitors. So they have specific behaviors of impedance. Is it whether or not they're in parallel or series? Or series? Mm -hmm. Is it like how they're connected in parallel or series? It depends on how they connected in parallel and series, yes, but how do you know which one is which? Memorization. You cannot memorize all the possible circuits. So this is impossible, but infinite number of them. It's all kind of configurations of capacitors, uh, inductors, resistors. You know. you know. And you obviously have also other stuff like cooperation amplifiers, which will complicate a lot of the same distributions. So I don't think that you can memorize it somehow. You, um, you need to memorize basically only three things. Yes. As the uh, frequency gets higher, the impedance of the inductor gets higher, and the impedance of the capacitor gets lower. This is exactly how you need to. This is exactly the thing that you need to remember. You need to remember that impedance of resistor is not changing as a function of frequency. Impedance of capacitor is getting lower when you're getting higher frequency, and impedance of coil or inductor is getting the opposite from the capacitor. Okay? So basically you're thinking about that like that. Let's say let, let's start with some low frequency here, right? And we need to check is it blocking that low frequency or not. So for low frequency here is like DC, okay? Let's let's think about DC. Is it blocking DC frequency here? So DC frequency flowing easily through the inductor, right? So it's like zero impedance. Mm -hmm. No resistance at all for DC. So it's kind of short circuit here, mm -hmm. right? So everything gets to the output. This one is disconnected for DC, right? It's like infinite impedance, mm -hmm. completely disconnected. And this is some resistance. So this resistance compared to this resistance, which is almost zero, is basically everything falls on that resistor, right? Mm -hmm. You have nothing to divide it. Which means that the input will be transferred to the out as this, yeah. or almost as this, okay? Assuming that this thing is ideal, this thing is ideal. Now, this means that you passing the, the low frequencies. Now, how about high frequencies? Very high frequencies. So super strong sign here, very, very fast. Now, this will go huge impedance, like will be huge resistance to the input signal, right? This will be almost what? Short circuit, short. Mm -hmm. so basically short circuit is the output, right? Because it's in parallel to the output. So how much voltage you can get in the output if you short circuit it? Zero, yeah. right? Passing. So your output is zero for very, very high frequencies. And it doesn't matter what configuration you use, you always can use that kind of logic. Okay, you're thinking what will be short circuited and what will be disconnected in terms of capacitors and conductors. And then you know if it is passing low frequencies or high frequencies or band frequencies, somewhere in the middle, right? This is how you, how you do it at least for most simplistic circuits. Now, <coughs> any questions on the intuition behind that? Okay, now, a little bit tricky question. 
Now I'm removing that thing and putting that thing here. This is my ground now. Why would you do that? Why not? <laughs> I want to connect that thing to my metal body of my car, okay? And this is ground, obviously. Instead of connecting that lower part, I, this one is closer to some metallic big part of the Isn't car. It's essentially the same thing, or if you want the hybrid. Will it change anything? This is a question. Or what it will change? The high frequency reacts the same way, but the low frequency is not the same. So now, obviously, this voltage compared to this point will be inverted, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, what will happen to that circuit? Is anything here changes as a function of that change? It reverses transfer function, reverses voltage, reverses what? The voltage. It will be different field then? Be low. This is low was before. It was low was yeah. Now will it be something else? High pass filter. Mm High -hmm. pass filter because I connected different points to ground. No, because the inductors are still in the same place, so it's going to be. Yeah, so, so the correct answer to that nothing will change. Absolutely nothing. That this is exactly the same circuit. It doesn't matter where you de define oh, your this is, ground point. This is what you're talking about. It doesn't about. matter at all. Okay. You can define your ground point anywhere you want. You can define it here, you can define it here, there, there, wherever you want. This is just virtual point. Compared to that point, you're measuring voltages. So you will call your voltage positive or negative depends on that point. Like if you want voltage from here to there, it will be still the same positive voltage if it was positive before. Why? Because compared to that point, that point will be negative. Right. Mm -hmm. Because V out is positive, right? Some 5 volts, okay? So let's say V out is 5 volts when it was connected here. Now, you're connecting that thing here, this becomes minus 5 volts. Now, this is zero. Mm -hmm. So it's still plus 5 volts from here to there. It doesn't matter where you connect that point of reference. It's just relative point of reference. It's not changing anything in the circuit itself. And this is true for any grounding circuits, unless you have absolute ground, which is an even trickier question, where you have another circuit, which is powered by different battery, and then you want to connect them together. Then it might become a problem when you have two different grounds, and each one contradicts another one. This is how people don't oscilloscopes generally. They just connect to power supply, which has completely different ground, and ground of oscilloscope connecting to ground of uh, other circuit, which is powered by different power supply. And then you have a lot of smoke. <laughs> Very fun. A lot of fun. Speaking from experience? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions on that? When can we burn our oscilloscope? <laughs> First, you need to buy a source. Okay, so this is step number one. Yeah. Then, do we pay 1983 prices in the lab, or do we pay real time prices like that? <laughs> Look, now a oscilloscope you can buy for $60. It's like computer USB oscilloscope, pretty cheap. So you can burn as many as you want. Not even so much. $60 is a lot of money for me. That's like a whole month's worth. Well, yeah. If, if, you only, if you only go to burn, burn it, so that's a lot of money. Yeah. Yes, you shouldn't do that. But compared to the funds that we get from that? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't a little one following me. Yeah, the best price is the funds. Any other questions? Okay, now I want to solve a very theoretical question. Okay. On filters. Um, and this question appeared in exams about five or six times. The same question. And people keep failing the question continuously in all those years. I don't know why. The question looks like that because probably it's too much demand. Using Fourier transform. <coughs> For the analysis, let's say. Okay. 
kill more people fail. That's a war. Forward then. What is math? Difficult question. This is formal form. <laughs> It's not a scripture. Cannot be built. And sometimes we like to add something like assure your answer addresses both the frequency domain and the time domain, which makes it even more difficult to understand. Now, overall idea is that you need to prove some form of mathematics or to write some sort of formal, to write some sort of ideas, which shows that LPF cannot exist in real physical world. Ideal LPF. And we know that ideal LPF looks like that. Right, so this is the magnitude of ideal LPF. So you have some bandwidth from minus B to B. Right? This is omega, this is magnitude of H and B. So it's flat here, zero here. Okay? Why is that thing cannot exist? Any ideas? It's not a causal system. Or it is okay. This is obviously something that you would like to prove, but how? So we know that non-causal systems cannot exist in physics. Right, something where you need to know the future. Now, how do we prove that something is not causal? We, we do an integral of something times the e to the minus j omega t. First of all, we want to know what is impulse response of the system. Right. What's that? Um, so we do the e of t minus. So this is basically magnitude of transfer function. Right? An ideal function will be kind of uh, exponent in the band with linear phase and then zero outside of the band minus b to b. So what will be inverse transform of force of that kind? Because this is what ideal thing is. You have it in the paintings. No, I don't. It's the very presentation. Pools between minus b and b. I have it for you. So it's width of the pulse, which is twice b divided by 2 pi times sinc. Width of the pulse divided by 2 pi times t. Okay, where the hell? This is given, I don't remember the exact number, but this is pulse. You can take it as step minus step. Same thing. You have that specific number? No, this is not that one. And this is in the table of transforms. So here. Rect rectangular pools. Okay. This is rectangular pools which is scaled to minus b plus b, so you need to use scaling property of the, of the rectangular pools. Okay, so we get something like that. This also will be cancelled. Now, what's wrong with that thing? Do you know how it looks like? Uh, In time? How sync function looks like? Okay. Sine x divided by x? Looks kind of like a... Um, so it's starting with some point here and then it's going like that. About, yeah. Bouncing like that. Something of that kind in time. Do you see any problem with that thing? Mm. Why that thing cannot be causal? Because it's a ripple. Not because of the ripple. Because it's defined for negative time? Exactly. It is defined for negative time. And delta happens when? This is impulse response, right? So this is response of the function of whatever to something which looks like that at zero time. Mm. Right? And this is you all. 
delta happens at zero time. Before zero time, you don't have any activity in the signal, right, from minus infinity to zero. So there is no input to the system before zero time. At zero time, you have a huge delta. But response starts at minus infinity time, even before the delta came in, which means the system cannot be physically possible, right? Because your response comes before your input, right? This is the explanation, mathematical explanation, why this filter cannot really exist in physics, okay? The system is not causal. And this is the reason, because the, your input or response to your impulse comes before the impulse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. questions? Okay, the last standard question on the tests, and in general, you will have more of that kind of questions in communications, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and other topics of difficult kind, how filters work on different signals, right? So you have given signal, signal is given by something crazy, like sine of a pi t times cosine square and this is applied to the TI system. Frequency response, frequency transfer function. I'm replacing S with J omega, because this is frequency that we are interested in. One half exponent minus J omega for omega smaller than 10 pi, and zero otherwise. You want to find the response in time domain of that kind of filter. Now, obviously, people who invented that kind of question love trigonometry. Okay. Awesome. I because thought you made this question. No, it's not my question. I just borrowed it with glee. Now, the entire trick here is to do trigonometry, basically. All you want to do is something that we did already in one of the early lectures is to write that thing as sum of sines and cosines of some kind. So you're doing some trigonometric tricks, you're doing some manipulations on sines and cosines to write it as Fourier series, essentially. And then for each one of them, you're just checking if it is passing that condition or not. If it is passing that condition, then you're including that in the final answer times that constant for that specific frequency. If it is not passing that condition, which means just omega bigger than 10 pi, then you just ignore it. That's it. So you're writing that entire thing a sum of signs of some kind at different frequencies, which is Fourier series essentially, and then you're checking if they are passing through the filter. Because every frequency multiplied by absolute value of h at that specific frequency, right? There's like body diagrams. So it's like gain per frequency. So this is gain per frequency, so absolute value of that thing multiplies that specific frequency, no matter what signal is. So if you have some sinusoidal waves, each sign will have its own gain. And this gain will be different based on the other diagram of the kind. This is 
all you need to know. Now, I'm passing fast through the solution, so x of t will be simplified something like that. This is because cosine square of 2 pi t is basically 1 plus cosine 4 pi t double angle divided by 2. Now, here we want to use multiplication of sine and cosine. Sine theta 1, cosine theta 2 equals. Sine theta 1 minus theta 2 plus sine theta 1 plus theta 2. You have all those things in tables. So this thing will be sine 8 by t divided by 2 plus sine 4 by t divided by 4 plus sine 12 pi t divided by 4. So this is after some trigonometry. So we have some of three sine functions. Now, what it will be multiplied by? So obviously omega here is 8 pi, here is 4 pi, and here is 12 pi. Right, those are the omegas for each one of those sine waves. Mm -hmm. Now, what that thing will be multiplied by? Yeah. So obviously 12 pi is not here. Yeah. So it gets into the else category. Right, so it will be multiplied just by zero coefficient here. So this will disappear. Now, this will be 8 pi, so it's still here in that region. So you put in j, 8 pi, an exponent of minus that thing times one half, absolute value, this will be the coefficient that you get here. So, you'll have something like that. y of t will be h of 8 pi times sine 8 pi t divided by 2 plus h 4 pi and sine 4 pi t divided by 4. Now, so that thing is 1 half exponent minus g h 8 pi. And that thing is one half e minus j four pi. Now we want to simplify that thing. So what that thing is? So what is e to the power of minus j eight pi? Uh, one. One. Because every double pi you have circle of 1. Mm -hmm. 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, all of them are 1. So that thing is just 1 half. How about this one? 1. The same thing. 1 half. And this one is always multiplied by 0, so I'm just ignoring it. The last one. So you get sine of 8 pi t divided by 4, which was like 1 half times 1 half, mm -hmm. and plus sine 4 by t divided by 8, which is 1 fourth multiplied by 1 half. This is all of the figure. Hmm. Any questions? Yeah, what? So, here you have 
one half, which is h of eight pi, multiplied by sine of eight pi t divided by two, which is one fourth times z single, right? So it's like one half times one half, which is one over four, multiplied by z. Then you have h of four pi, which is again one half, right? Because this is what it is by z definition. So it's one half times sine divided by four, which is that thing, which is that thing, plus zero multiplied by that one, which is zero. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you don't have any questions, that's it for today.